Today, we're going to discuss photographing NCAA wrestling on Behind the Shot. Hi, welcome to Behind the Shot. I'm Steve Brazel. We've got a great show lined up for you today. I do want to remind you that this show has show notes associated with it, as for that matter, every episode that I do does. You can find the show notes in two places. If you go to BehindTheShot.tv, I've got a thing that I wrote about my guest today and all the links that we talk about, small gallery of his work as well. Or if you're watching on YouTube and you head down below the subscribe and like button, you'll find some of the show notes there as well. All the links are down there. But again, it's not the full blog post as it were. So if you want to know more, head on over to the blog post. And that brings us up to today's guest, which is an interesting story behind the reason that he's even here. I want to welcome Levy Ventura to the show. Levy, how are you? I'm good, Steve. How you doing? I'm good. It is nice to meet you. Uh, I'm a fan of your work. And you. I said it was strange the way that you ended up here because I was not familiar with your work. I am now. But you were a suggestion of Jeremy Lantern on Twitter. And just so that people know, if you want to go follow Jeremy, give him some love for recommending a guest. Uh, Snackem, S-N-A-C-K-E-M on Twitter is, is Jeremy's Twitter handle. So... Let's let's talk about you for a second. And actually, now that I think about it, I got to say one other thing. The microphone that you're using is a Shure SM7B. It's not your microphone. We got to give not a mine. shout out to the guy that lent it to you. So who is it? Yes, sir. My buddy, Jordy, he's a music producer. He's singer and stuff like that. So I was like, hey, man, I have a podcast on Wednesday. I have crappy audio equipment except for my Rode microphone. Can I please borrow your gear? So everything I'm using right now is is his. So shout out. To well, him. Uh, what, what's his first name again? Jordy. Jordy. Thank you, buddy. Appreciate your lending him the microphone because now I get great audio for my podcast. I like that. So, uh, Levy, let's start with an, a, a little bit of background on you because when I was looking you up, kind of learning about you a little bit, there were some things that surprised me because your work is mm -hmm. really, really good. Uh, I appreciate that. You're still a college student. You're majoring mm -hmm. in graphic design, not photography? No. So a little bit on that, I mean, I started taking pictures a little more seriously as a more of a hobby than just casual stuff. Maybe when I was 16, I was leading up a little closer to senior year of high school. And, you know, that's around the time where I had to take into consideration those next steps, which is for me was college. So I had the sit down conversation with my parents. They're both um, more traditional. So I'm an immigrant here. I moved here when I was seven from Kuwait, of all places. Uh, both my parents and my family moved here. So they've always been very traditional in that sense. And they always wanted me to work in the medical field, nursing in particular, which is fine. You know, like uh, I always grew up with my mom being a nurse and I always respected her for that. But personally, I just knew it wasn't for me. You know, so once we start into that conversation of college, I chose business. <laughs> Just because I know for them, it would have been more of a okay, you know, like, okay, so it's it's not fully art. It, their main thing was just they don't want me, they didn't want me to be that starving artist, you know. So I chose business first, took a full year of that, took accounting, and then I was like, oh, yeah, this is not for me. So then that next year, I, would, I switched to graphic design. And that graphic design, not photography, has always been a thing. For me, because like I said, I started when I was 16, taking it more seriously. So I always knew that passion would be there and that passion to grow would always be there for photography. But in terms of finding a job as well, I just wanted to give myself that extra tool, basically. First of all, to your mom for being a nurse. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, first of all, career in high demand for number one, but also just such an amazing thing to do for society. But- mm -hmm. I, you know, I know a lot of people that have from varying cultures, though, that traditional kind of parental guidance, we'll call it, <laughs> background, <laughs> yeah, that kind, yeah. tends to not be real favorable of the creative space. Yeah. So I'm glad that you're in the space. You've only been a freelance photographer since 2019. Mm -hmm. And while today we're going to talk about the, the NCAA wrestling type stuff, your website bio mentions that really your focus photography wise is small brand, uh, small business and brand social stuff. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of curious, you know, helicopter view, how one goes from the more business and branding photography 
mm-hmm. to photographing high-end NCAA wrestling. Uh, yeah, it's been it's been a weird journey so far. Uh, basically, it's just I never really say no. I don't really have the the capabilities right now, especially if I do want to make money to say no to some projects like that. So that is my main goal and want to do. I I love doing stuff for social media. That's kind of where I found my my calling card, I guess, for social media and stuff like that. So in terms of that NCAA stuff, it wasn't technically for NCAA um, specifically. It was for a different team that found me on and they specifically wanted me to provide them with social media photography. So it kind of all lined up pretty nicely there. I got to tell you, man, you've only been doing this since 2019. Uh, Your portfolio is great. The wrestling stuff, I mean, you've ended up working with people like Olympic gold medalists, uh, you know, Jordan Mm -hmm. Burroughs, and obviously taking photos like the one that we're going to cover today. Before we get into today's image, a couple things I just want to remind people about. Again, this is a podcast first and foremost. So you can find this podcast wherever you get your podcast. You can get it in either an audio-only format, if that happens to be something that you want, or if you want to see the video version, and we are talking about a photograph, so there, there are advantages to the video version. If your podcast outlet of choice supports video, the podcast is available in a video format too. If your podcast app of choice doesn't support video, you can get the video on YouTube, which again is YouTube slash behind the, YouTube, YouTube.com slash behind the shot uh, and all the episodes are there. And again, all the links and everything are there as well. Um, I think that's about, oh, you know what? One other thing I want to do, I'm in high def here and I want to thank my friends over at dvestore.com for that. Uh, appreciate it. dvestore.com for all your digital video equipment needs. Head on over there, check it out. So Levi or Levy, I keep saying yeah, Levi because is. so that people know First that yeah, I knew it was going to happen. We talked about it in the green, green room. It's spelled L-E-V-I, which where I come from, mm-hmm. we would normally say Levi, but it's actually Levy, like a, a mm-hmm. like when the Levy breaks, Led Zeppelin. Um, one of my favorite songs. Sorry, I'm aging nice. myself now. So, <laughs> and we were talking earlier because I photographed Beartooth last week, the week before we yeah, were recording yeah. this, and you're a fan of Beartooth. So, yeah. uh, which by the way, if you've never seen Beartooth live, fantastic I show live. I got it, yeah. Yeah, absolutely insane energy on stage. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about this shot because the story behind this shot, I'm guessing is kind of interesting. This is the Gable Stevenson flip. Stevenson, I'm sorry, Stevenson. 2020 Olympic uh, Games gold medalist, Dan Hodge trophy winner, two-time NCAA Division I national champion, three-time Big Ten conference champion, three-time All-American, and is now a wrestler signed to the uh, WWE's Raw brand, which, Mm -hmm. okay, Definitely a career in front, but Mm -hmm. let's talk about this flip because based on how I learned about this shot, I am guessing that uh, this is something that he does a lot. Let's start here. Gear and exposure. What Do you remember what body and lens you shot this with? So I recently just picked up the Sony a7 IV and uh, this is like my favorite lens right now, the Tamron. 35 to 150 f2 to 2.8 so this is what i used the entire week for the ncaa tournament i didn't know about that lens that's a nice range and a really it's nice aperture range amazing it's amazing 2 to 2.8 yeah so about 35 it stays at 2 but then once you get to 50 it goes like 2.6 and so on but it's a lot sharper than i expected for for wow. tamron specifically too so. okay uh interesting so what about exposure information? So obviously this is a composite, but you would not have changed exposure mid, you know, mid speed mm-hmm. burst here. What did so, you have exposure wise? Yeah. Um, so it's kind of wonky a little bit in my personal opinion. So my, good. Yeah. So my shutter speed is at 5,000, one over 5,000, uh, F 2.8, uh, 86 millimeter focal length and ISO 2000. Wow. Okay. I got to break that down here for a second because ISO 2000 is telling me that it wasn't super bright in here, Mm -hmm. but at ISO 2000, you were able to get five thousandth of a second. When you're shooting, when you're shooting this type of thing, do you normally aim that high? It was just for this shot. I think for most of the other wrestling stuff, I was 2,500, 2000 ish for my shutter speed. But this one, I was like, because 
again, like going back to where we heard of Gable first, or where I heard of Gable first, I knew he was going to do this flip and I knew it was going to be his last one. So I just, I just cranked that baby as high as I can and set my exposure correctly. So, okay. Let me, let me explore that a second here. How did you know this was going to be his last one? How did you even know he was going to do this? So this is something he's known for, I gather. Yeah. How did you know it was his last one? Uh, so he announced it at the beginning of his uh the NCAA wrestling season, I guess that it would be his last season in uh NCAA wrestling. So you mentioned that he's signed now with the WWE, Raw specifically. So he already has you know a future basically outside of this wrestling world and collegiate wrestling anyway. So he he announced it and he said he retired the backflip a little later than that a little sooner i think when the olympics wrapped up he he's a he's a showman so he always like he kind of plays with people's emotions he knows how to get them to the highs to the lows and how to bring them back to the highs you know kind of thing so even just in twitter he knows how to do that really well so he announced that he retired it but he he kind of kept it there like at the back burner like oh maybe at my last my last competition when i put my shoes on the mat maybe you guys will see something that you'll never forget kind of thing. And like I said, he's a showman. And he, he's awesome at that kind of thing. So he's not a small dude either. No, no. And, and so let me do this. Let me do this. I'm going to describe the shot for those of you that are on the audio feed. For those of you on the video feed, uh, you already see the shot, but I would recommend that you kind of pay attention to the description anyway, because you're going to learn a lot by a deep dive into describing a photo verbally. When I say he's not a small guy, he's not a small guy. I mean, this guy is built. And what's interesting in this backflip that he's doing, that the highest peak dead center frame of the image, he's up. I mean, this guy's got air like, wow. It's a landscape orientation shot. In fact, specifically, it's about a 16-9 ratio, right? Picture, if you would, college NCAA wrestling, high-end wrestling mats, right? Which strangely are not lit that well, but they tend to have one spotlight dead center, which for me would be weird if you're out there actually wrestling where you'd move in and out of shadow almost. I think that would be kind of odd. But behind is a tiered set of, you know, the stands with the, the, the stand, you know, with the viewers in it. But the crowd is extremely dark. So you see them kind of with the, the diffused light coming from the spotlight that's on the mat, right? And it's dead center. The mat looks like a bullseye. So there's a circle in the middle, then there's black, and then there's like a bluish ring on the outside. The majority of it is, is the darker part, the blackish part in the middle. On the right-hand side is Gable. Looking like he's kind of, his feet are apart, his, his right foot's behind him on the toe. His left foot is planted. He's leaning forward like he's kind of running. He's smiling, which is the part that is so fascinating to me. Like he's enjoying this and he's building up speed and then boom, he's off the ground. The second frame, he's facing, the first frame, he's facing camera left as he goes in. Second frame, he's flipped around. He's actually facing camera right, feet towards the mat, kind of curled up behind him, his head starting to lean back behind him. Next, he's completely upside down, head looking down at the mat, and he's dead center in the spotlight, super bright at this point, right? After that, he is completely upside down. Head facing the mat, it looks dangerous, which I love. The next frame, because there's a, a grand total here of six frames, the next frame, he's face down. And on the last one, it's almost like a superhero landing with his left foot, up, knee bent, his right knee is almost on the ground, and he's kind of kind of flexing a little bit is, is the best way to, you know, kind of word this. What I love about this is the way that he changes through the light, right? So the light mimics the energy. He starts smiling, his face is lit, his body is darker. As he gets up to peak performance, upside down, back towards the mat, stomach towards the ceiling, he's dead center under the spotlight, and then he fades basically back to the mat. And I, and I want to go to, to Levy, what you said on Twitter when you posted this. 
and this is quoting, the first time I ever heard of Gable, Gable Stevenson was last year when I saw clips of this beast doing backflips. And I said to myself, I want to photograph it someday, lucky enough to capture his last one. So you knew you wanted this. Mm -hmm. Was it what you expected? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just going into what you were talking about, like how that first frame is him smiling. When I was going back and making this composite, I was like, that first frame is everything that he loves to do. You know, like the backflip and stuff is cool, but just him on the mat smiling. That's that's it. I mean, I've talked to him off the mat as well, so I know what kind of character he is. But that smile, that smile says it all. You know, and it really does. Be, it, it, we want to tell stories, right? And this is journalism, right? We want to tell a story. What I love about this is there's like three or four stories in here. There's the crowd behind in darkness watching something happen. There is the act of NCAA wrestling in the mat. There's the backflip itself. There's the lighting. And there's that smile. That smile, his face is even like he's facing from the right, far, far right side of the 69 ratio frame. He's facing his body to the, to the left of the frame, but his head is tweaked ever so slightly towards you so that you can clearly see with a beard, by the way. Mm. This smile and in this dark frame that could be lost, but you managed to get that. I, you know, I just thought of something. Was this the only six frames that you shot? Was were there in between frames that you ignored Ooh. and didn't use? Yeah, I can't give a number, but I would say about a hundred shots. I was just bursting through in his entire flip, which was about maybe ten seconds from start to finish. So I like run up, flip down, maybe ten seconds because you know he was hyping up the crowd. <laughs> doing all that. So I had maybe about a hundred plus shots. So I was looking at each one intentionally. I knew specifically that one in the middle where he's like upside down. Love, yeah. yeah. I love his posture. And somebody in on Twitter said it was like a, a shark coming out of the water to feed on its prayer. So I was like, Oh, I didn't think about that. But you know, kind of like just, there's just so much power that you can tell from, from that posture. Cause even a even a smaller person wouldn't be able to do that, let alone a I think he was 285, 280 at this point, heavyweight. So it's it's pretty insane. But in terms of the composition itself, I love that you're pointing out the little things because I did make the background darker so he can stand out more. And I put that spotlight directly into that middle spot specifically to give that spotlight that you're talking about before. So this composite specifically, I really fine-tuned to tell those stories that we're talking about. It's it, okay. It's interesting what you just said though, because you're, you're, you're thinking about the end result. And, and I love that, right? You, you knew what you wanted to get. You weren't afraid to let it fly. You weren't afraid to use 2000 ISO or 5,000 shutter speed. How far away are you here? Like, where are you? Oof. Um, almost in the stands. Almost in the stands. Um, so they had this rule at the NCAA finals specifically that you needed a sticker basically that said you're photographing heavyweight, you're photographing 174, blah, 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 blah. So like I said before, a specific school hired me, Virginia Tech. I wouldn't even have gotten this shot if they didn't hire me. They hired me for that weekend and they only had one finalist. So I only had one access or access to only one match of the finals. So I was basically in the stands. I was right behind the media, the people who make blogs, uh, Twitter posts and stuff like that. I was right behind them. But the photographers, the photo media was like right there next to the next to the mat. Okay. But in the end, I like that. I like that point of view a lot more just because I was able to go wider and still kind of keep compression at 86 millimeters, you know? Because if I was too close, I would have to go. Uh, I would have had to gone to like thirty-five, something wider. Then I wouldn't have been able to get that whole stage. So it's actually, well, something about this shot, every piece of that is a different photo. Well, the other thing is, I think if you were closer and had to shoot at thirty-five or something, I think even with perspective correction, mm -hmm. it's not just the compression. I I think that angle would have changed him, and yep. being at eighty-five. I think 
lets him look lean and big and and mm-hmm. and the 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 strength that he has. I'm wondering something though. So I shoot action, low light action photography with music. Mm-hmm. Focus is always an issue, right? You've got a focus yeah. point. He's running up. He's smiling. You're focusing on him. You know he's about to leap in the air. You could just use a zone and let it follow him. You could use a single focus point and pan with him. You could, I mean, there's a million ways that you could do this. So explain to me the the AF setup that you use. Where were you focused and kind of what mode were you using? So for the Sony setup, I mainly just have it at center. That's all it is. I kind of sets up a box just right in the middle of the frame. And that's what I use for. That's mainly what I use for sports and stuff anyway, because I like to reframe stuff later on. So it doesn't matter to me if something's like dead in the middle because I reframe later. But specifically for this, I've I'm most comfortable with that autofocus setting, like you're saying. And I kind of did that pan, the follow pan throughout. And I, I just held my breath. I was like, please don't lose focus don't focus to the background kind of thing you know is because from that distance from 85 uh, millimeters the depth of field wasn't too great like if i was just slightly off to the left or to the right it would definitely pick up the the audience a lot quicker so a little bit of luck definitely but yeah at 85 i'm thinking of that that peak shot the one where he's upside down, dead center in the spotlight, right? Mm-hmm. As you're as you're panning up and over, and and the camera lens is is going up. With that top shot, would you have still had the mat? Were you wide enough to have the mat in the audience in every shot? That's what I'm saying. I, w- I was trying to say before. So like everything in this composite is a separate photo. So before he started his flip, I just zoomed out to 35 real quick, and I got a photo oh. of the stage. Yeah, because I knew that would happen. Like you're saying that the mat would just be gone. Oh, yeah. okay. Then we yeah. got to get into composite stuff here in just a second because I have questions now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, first, let's talk this because you're locked in at five thousandth, uh, five thousandth of a second, two point eight or whatever it was, mm-hmm. two thousand ISO. But as he is starting in, and again, for those of you on the audio feed, you'll understand when you go to BehindTheShot.tv and you and you look at the shot, right? He's dark on both sides. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, I'm not saying there's no detail. There's he's there, He's there, right? There's tons of detail. But compared to when he's dead center under that spotlight, there's a two-stop difference, maybe three-stop difference between under the spotlight and where he started. Were, were you... Were you aware? I mean, obviously you were aware. Were you thinking, oh my gosh, he's going to start here. When he's at the peak, I'm going to blow out all my highlights or vice versa. I'm going to be exposed for the, when he's in that spotlight, at which point, oh my God, he's going to be a blob of darkness on Mm -hmm. the sides and I'm going to have to bring the shot. Were you thinking that? And if so, what made you settle on the exposure? Was your exposure set for the highlights or was your exposure set for the dark sides? It was definitely exposed for the highlights, especially, again, that middle shot. Like, I've posted that one separately. I wanted to make prints of that one separately. I knew that peak one was my end goal. Like, this little composite didn't come to me till later. So, like, okay. on the day of the shoot, shooting it, I just wanted the backflip midair to be perfectly exposed. So that's why I kind of took a shot of the, the mat itself with the spotlight on it as well just so i knew if the blue or whatever on the on the mat was exposed right he should be exposed right as well when he hits that spot you mean the blue in the middle yes yeah the 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 center ring the center ring yeah okay okay it was a lot of it was a lot of guessing right but that makes sense because i I was thinking to myself how are you going to pre-expose at that top part yep for the blue but really the reflection on the center of the mat where it hits you Mm -hmm. just got to be exposed for that and you know Mm -hmm. you're good Mm-hmm. Oh, interesting. And you you obviously had enough dynamic range leeway on your Sony. Yep. yep. Uh, wh- which Sony body was it? The A7 IV. A7 IV. You obviously mm-hmm. had enough exposure leeway on the body to bring those shadows back in. And I'm, I'm, we'll get to the post-production here in a minute. It's a great sequence for a composite. And I like, you know, the, the, 
the number of shots that you did, two leading up to a peak, three coming down. So it's two leading up, then the peak, then three unfolding shots, as it were. It's interesting to me that you liked frame three, where he's at the peak upside down. So I'm going to ask you a question. There is no wrong answer. (laughs) <laughs> but it's uh, the reason I'm curious about this this question is I'm wondering if we're going to pick the same one. Mm. And if you're watching this, do this in your head too. If you were to pick one frame from this that's not the dead center under the spotlight upside down. So that would be frame one, two, four, five, or six. Which one would you pick? Because to me, this one was mm-hmm. a no-brainer. Mm-hmm. That's that's. The, I would probably pick the first one when he was smiling, leading up to his uh his flip. If I couldn't choose the middle one, <laughs> interesting for me, it would be the second one. The second one because he's off the ground, his mm-hmm. feet are curling up, the way his head is leaning back, where I can still see his face, mm-hmm. uh, the arm out like he's balancing. Mm-hmm. Uh, Really, honestly, that's that's part of the reason when he suggested, hey, you should do a behind the shot on this shot. Part of the reason I thought, yeah, I should, is because every single frame you composited here could be a shot on its own. I mean, that it's that strong. So let's talk post-processing. First of all, mm-hmm. what's, your, what's your software of choice normally for processing? Uh, so... Like I said, I didn't really think about the composite till later. So I, I made everything, I color graded or whatever in Lightroom. And then later on, I brought in the, the unedited photos into Photoshop as well. Okay. And your normal workflow for just a non-composite shot is to just do everything in Lightroom mostly? Mm-hmm. Yeah. For assembling this composite, you did it obviously in Photoshop. Mm-hmm. They're all different shots. So you've got a 35 millimeter shot of the ring and the crowd empty. You have 85 millimeter shots of Gable doing this backflip, each one being, and this is where it gets weird, each one being a completely different perspective, right? Because when he's at the peak and you've lifted the camera up, now that entire scene is skewed Mm -hmm. compared to that first scene. So did you just do the grab the six shots and tell Photoshop, line them up? What did you do? Oh, no, I don't even know how to do that, if I'm being honest. So I I took all of the six photos. I punched out the backgrounds. And to me, the biggest thing was lining them up in an aesthetic way. That's why I have to tell people when they see the composite, no, he did not get that high. You know, it looks like he's 20 feet up in the air. But at the same time, I wanted to have that feeling in the composite because when you're there, when you're live and you see this 280 pound guy do his backflip, it it really does feel like he's just floating in the air for that split second. And I know all the fans of wrestling specifically know that feeling when they watch him do that. So I kind of wanted to exaggerate that a little bit, but not everything was fine tuned. Like I said, I don't know how to how to line them up on, How'd a, you cut on them Photoshop. Out? Um, so it's, uh, turns it into a layer and then remove background Okay. as a, as a, I think a new feature on Photoshop, but it saves me a lot of time. So I don't the have to select subject. trace them out. Yeah. Exactly. The select subject command. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, okay. So he, again, I want to stress to people that, you know, like you just said, it, he didn't really go that high. It's a composite. Yeah. You built a composite, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. But you built a composite that emphasizes the story. Exactly. Because... It's hard to explain to people if you're not seeing the picture in the video. This guy's not small, right? No. And he did a backflip. Absolutely insane. Okay, here's a question. Let's talk about processing these images to be Mm -hmm. composited, right? They all need to match. Exposure needs to be done. Color correction Mm -hmm. needs to be done, et cetera. So there's two schools of thought on that. I have, let's just say here that there's six backflip uh, uh, shots plus the background, right? So seven shots. I could color correct seven shots, then assemble them. Or 
I could assemble them and then color correct the end result or kind of a mixture of both, right? Mm -hmm. Where I do a little bit of processing on the individuals, then I assemble them and then I kind of tweak it. Which, which was it for you? I did the second one. So I got the uncolorized because like I have my own preset that I, I use for my work. So I took the no preset photos and I lined them up uh, the way I wanted. And to really get that look, there was a lot in Photoshop that I did before I colored it. So like the spotlight and like you were saying, how he pretty much fades out from uh, right to left. Right. So I did a lot of a lot of shadowing to kind of get that vignette like right to the middle of that spotlight. So then once I had everything framed and spotlighted, shadowed everything I wanted to do, I hopped into Lightroom. I exported it to Lightroom and that was just very minor. That was just for me to get skin tones the way I like to have skin tones in my photos. So, yeah. okay. What did you do to do that? Uh, again, like it's just my own preset. So it's, I don't know if you want me to get into specifics, but it's a lot of, uh, turning down the vibrance. Okay. Specifically. So then like it, doesn't look super orangey kind of gives it like the skin tones almost a muted tone and that's kind of been something i've been wanting to a little more subdued to, look yeah exactly exactly and that's something i have in my own stuff you, i guess you said something three times that i keep saying in my head don't forget to go back to that don't forget to go back mm -hmm. to that and it just hit me again when you mentioned you did the spotlight mm -hmm. was the light there and you just vignetted the top corners to emphasize it as a beam? Or did you mm -hmm. add a spotlight in Photoshop? I added it. But again, like... Really? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I added that in Photoshop. Oh, man. <laughs> Son of a... I... God, I'm stupid. No, no, no. That's a huge I, honestly, compliment on my end. The highest compliment I can give you right now is I thought he flipped into the damn spotlight that was there. God. No, I mean, I that was my one of my main concerns. Down. That was one of my main concerns making this composite because I have had a background, like I've done essays on photojournalism specifically, and there's like, you know, ethics lines that you can't cross That's to right. tell the story. So I was like, I know this will be good for the people, but I don't want other photographers coming after my neck saying, oh, this is fake. Like, I know he didn't get that high or like, I know the setting or the scene didn't look like that. But at the end of the day, this like this specific one still tells a story, but not less on the photojournalism side and more of like as if I was painting and putting the piece. It's together. a fine art piece. And, and by the Basically, way, yeah. You have the same issue I have, right? So in live music, part of the reason yeah. I love live music, and I, I tell people this when I do workshops and stuff, is you can take a picture. Let's just call picture number one, right? You can take picture number one and have to abide by photojournalistic ethics. Mm -hmm. I'm giving it to, it's based on end usage. I'm giving it to a magazine, a newspaper, a, a news blog, a music you know, site where journalism is involved. And so, you know, traditionally in journalism, it's anything that you can do in a dark room, which is crop, color correct, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. you know, straighten. Uh, you can't remove anything with a cloning tool, stuff like that. Yep. Now, the truth of the yep. matter is in a traditional dark room, all of that weird stuff was done. For, I don't know why we refer to it as anything in a traditional dark room. Strange things have been done in dark rooms. But, you know, it's basically co crop, color correct, that type of thing. Mm-hmm. But then I can take that same picture and if I'm licensing it to the venue or I'm licensing it to the band or the PR or the management, that same image is no longer photojournalism. Mm -hmm. It's marketing. Yep. That is a commercial shoot at that point. And you can do this all day long. I, I love the fact that you can mix the two. Mm -hmm. All right. God, it's a fake spotlight. So oh, <laughs> you have no idea what's happening in my head right now. That's a shout out to my uh, my Photoshop teacher, Chris Hadfield, right there. I did I honestly didn't have much experience making stuff like this till maybe last semester, like November or October of last year when I took his class, and he just showed me a bunch of little tricks to but make things look shadows. a little more real. You've even got shadows, dude. Yeah, I added on the map. <sighs> yep. Yeah, like I said, basically everything there is separate. Like if you took one piece out of every little thing, highlight shadows, it'll be a blank like piece of uh <laughs> canvas on photoshop 
Love it. I love it. Thank Jeremy you. that suggested having you on. I owe you, man. All right. So, um, wow. Just so good. Really, really, honestly. Let, let's switch gears here really quick. Thank you. Speed round. <laughs> oh. uh, I'm going to ask you some questions. Just answer them as fast as you want. Right? Mm -hmm. Your favorite sports photography tip. Oh, learn the sport. <laughs> I would say uh, so like since I've been shooting wrestling since maybe 2019, but then we had that whole gap year because of COVID. So I wasn't fully export, exposed to wrestling more than the, like I had a few months of in uh, 2019. So 2021, 2022 is my first full year of really diving into the sport. And there's so much more that you kind of don't understand if you're just an outs outsider looking in, even as a photographer. Like, that's why I knew this shot would be so special is because I dove into the sport. I got to know the people that watch the sport and not just an outsider taking right. photos that I think would look good on a, a sports um, post or something like that, you know? Okay. What's the biggest mistake you almost made or did make? For the specific shot or period? Period. Photography. Ugh. Sounds bad, but I almost listened to my parents. <laughs> <laughs> and became a nurse? Yeah. I okay. was I was getting I was getting close there. I mean, it's horrible to say because I mean, respecting your parents and all that has always been ingrained in me. But like I said, there was a time where I just sat down with my parents. I'm like, I'm not going to nursing school. Because I just knew that wasn't for me. And like I kind of had to I pretty much had a debate with my parents on, you know, like, no, this is not for me. I want to be something else kind of thing. And I almost caved. I almost gave in just because I do respect my parents so much. And like you said, I respect what my mom does so much. So I was like, who am I to say no to, to helping other people basically? But well, I, I knew I had a different path. Let's just do this really quick. We're, we'll back up right now. <laughs> if Levy's parents are watching this, fast forward over the next 43 seconds. <laughs> We We've had handled. this conversation. Yeah. We've had we this conversation. Didn't happen. Didn't happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, your favorite composition rule, if you have one. Oh, mm, I don't know specifically about rules, just because, like I said, I learned basically everything on my own, but like the, I, I don't even know specific terms, but the thirds. Yeah, framing, rule of thirds. Yeah, rule of thirds. I love the bottom right or the bottom left and having a lot of space up top and just having like your subject facing basically nothing, you know, like if this was the end of the frame and I was facing this way, I love that so much. And having that extra space, negative okay. space. Basically. Builds tension. That's nice. Mm -hmm. What's your favorite drink? <laughs> Lemonade. Okay. For me, Diet Coke. What is that right there? Diet Coke. D nice. Yeah, Diet Coke. What's your favorite band or artist? Oh, right now, Bruno Mars, 100%. Okay. Is there a photographer that you think more people should know about and follow? Uh, yes. So in terms of the wrestling world, there's one man that I first, when I first got into wrestling photography, um, his name's Tony Rotundo. I hope I said his last name right. I've only ever referred to him as Tony, but... I mean, for, for a guy who's in wrestling, he's like his social media isn't bad. He's at like 30 something K thousand followers, which is really good for the sport. But in terms of like maybe the next person you interview for something like this, he's the person that I want people to know. Because I mean, in other sports, I feel like there's always been people around there just because those sports have been more popular. But for wrestling specifically, like it's not even his full time gig shooting wrestling. Like he has to go back to his uh, his day job whenever, and then he just travels on the weekends for tournaments like these. And he's a dedicated man to this sport, so he's always someone I give respect to. And what's his name again? Tony Rotundo. Tony Rotundo. Okay, I'm assuming mm -hmm. he's on Instagram and stuff too. Yes. All right, so I'll make sure links to Tony and to uh, Levy and everything that you need are going to be in the show notes at BehindTheShot.tv. Mm -hmm. Speaking of which, if people want to follow you, what's your website for your portfolio? My website is levyvphoto.com. Uh, okay. And again, Levy is L-E-V-I. So some of you may mm -hmm. think of it as Levi, but it's actually Levy is how it's pronounced. So, and the V for Ventura. So, so mm -hmm. levyvphoto.com. And then 
social media wise, I've been putting them up on the screen as we've been talking, but they're a little different based on everywhere you go. So let me just yeah. run through them really quick. Video wise, it's all the same. YouTube, Vimeo, it's all Levy Ventura. Mm -hmm. And then Instagram, it's Levy Ventura dot photo. Mm -hmm. Twitter, it's Levy Ventura underscore. Right. Mm -hmm. Did I miss any? No, that, those are the four I use all the time. Okay. Again, to remind everybody, show notes, BehindTheShot.tv, links to all of Levy's stuff, sample gallery of his work, but go check out his portfolio, and a little blog post that I, I wrote about Levy. Uh, dude, just such, so good. It's, Thanks, you made man. the spotlight. I'm, Thank oh, you, dude. God, Thank, you made I mean, the that really, That really means a lot. Like, I... I take everything that like seasoned veterans of f photo, video, whatever, like I take everything that they say or any compliments to heart because like I, I look up to everyone who's been doing this longer than I have. So that really means a lot. I, I'm the same way. I, I have a, a old saying that came from martial arts background, but uh, we stand on the shoulders of those that came before us. Yeah, exactly. I'm a firm believer in that. You can learn a lot from people that came before you, even if it's not your genre. Even if mm -hmm. it's, you know, you may look at it and go, yeah, I just, uh, I, I have no desire for that. Mm -hmm. Somebody's always got something that you can learn from. So Levy, thank you so much for doing this, man. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And to everybody, make sure that you go check out the blog post. Again, it's at behindtheshot.tv. All the show notes are there for every episode that I do. If you want more about me, it's at stevebrazel.com. It's like the country Brazil, but two L's. And if you want to follow me on social media, I've kind of abandoned Facebook, but the pages are still there behind the shot TV, Steve Brazel Photography. Mostly you're going to find me at either Twitter or Instagram, and it's at Steve Brazel for my personal ones, Twitter or Instagram, or at behind the shot TV, Twitter or Instagram. If you want to follow the podcast, I'd appreciate it if you follow both. Oh, you know what? One other thing I wanted to re remind you of. Uh, if you are doing this on YouTube, please do subscribe to the channel, hit the like button, you know, all of that type of stuff and, and share it with your friends. It would be much appreciated. And just as importantly, I've been checking recently some of the reviews I'm getting, for example, on Apple Podcasts. And I just found one from Great Britain that was amazing. Uh, there's been a couple recently from Canada and the US that are amazing. I just want to thank everybody doing that. And if you have not done that, if you could go leave us a star rating, a written review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts, it'd be much appreciated. Make sure you join us next time on Behind the Shot as we take a look inside the mind of a great photographer by taking a closer look behind one of their shots. Music.